Hi everyone. Today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hugh Jelly. Hugh is the founder and CEO of Arta Regenerative. Um, he's got a veterinarian background and a very special interest in ruminant nutrition and regenerative organizations. So today I'm looking forward to talking to Hugh about the philosophy behind regenerative organizations and the roles that these play in human health, animal welfare, and taking care of our planet. So I'll let you tell, I'll let Hugh tell you more about um, himself and his journey. So Hugh, thanks for being here today. Looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Yeah, yeah thanks Susan. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, good to be on board and thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, look, I guess a little bit about my background is, as you say, I'm a, I'm a veterinarian. I've worked um, principally or virtually all of my life in the large animal sector and a lot of it in dairy farming. Spent, um, I guess I've always um, try, had an inquisitiveness to try and find, look behind things and get a bit of an understanding as to why things have happened and um, got interested early in my career in what we call preventative medicine and uh, developed that into... Um, having a more of a holistic approach, trying to understand uh, more the whole of what's going on and in behind that, what could be causing some of the issues that we deal with. And um, I'd set up a, a, a practice based around that. Um, also, I had a specialist interest in reproduction and ruminant nutrition to try and help me understand a little bit more of what's going on when we uh, were dealing increasingly with chronic diseases and cattle. And, um, you know, the irony of that was the more and more we tried to intervene and prevent things and uh, yeah the more and more we needed to and uh, it just became obvious one day in fact I can remember the day I was standing on the race um, working with a client I've been working with for about 18 years and just watch, watching a large herd go by and just looking at them and thinking they, they just don't like, look right they look uncomfortable a lot of them just look a little bit lame and tucked up and that was kind of what we were working with everywhere was these animals had um, they were just uncomfortable and, and when we look into it and start to examine it and research it a bit more, they, they had what we call subclinical ruminal acidosis, which went that the rumen, the rumen wasn't well. And it's, uh, the irony of that is it's pretty much what we're dealing with across the board when we look at people and chronic diseases and people. Um, we, you know, we're mucking up, we, we, we forget that actually we don't feed just the person or the animal, we're actually feeding a a whole mix of bacteria and fungi and protozoa and uh, so if we want if we want to have a healthy animal or a healthy person we've got to first think about how we actually make keep that balance and keep that biota that healthy and um, so I you know, started to get a lot more interested in that and look behind that and you know and I think as somebody some comedian said once well in the end the answer lies in the soil when we uh, when we sort of pull it all down, if we, if we keep killing our soil and damaging our soil, we can't actually it, it, we can't actually deliver on any of these outcomes because they're all connected. So, uh, yeah, start to get a lot more involved in that and understanding how that works and holistic management and principles of regenerative and um, yeah, so that's kind of brought me to where I am now. So you work with the Savory Institute, is that correct? Yeah, so... Um, or work alongside them? Well, the, so the Savory Institute is, was set up on the work that Alan Savory's done or started sort of 40, 50 years ago. And, and I linked up with him. Um, or quite, so I've got a real interest in elephants and, and um, <laughs> he's done a lot of work in elephants as well. And I've done a bit of reproductive work in elephants. So we, we kind of connected. Um, but he, he really challenged a lot of conventional thinking around, particularly the role that animals play in, uh, in grasslands and um, rejuvenization and just maintaining, if you like, the health of grasslands. And he basically challenged convention and has, and I guess in a much lesser way, I've done the same thing with kind of the process that we've taken. And um, so we, we were sort of seemed to be on a parallel path. And, and um, so they, they have a, a program around a global program which is helping uh, the regeneration of grasslands and pasture lands and and, and uh, um, grazing particularly around the grazing of animals and uh, I so I got involved with them a number of years ago and they have a, 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 um, a global network of people 
and organisations working with that is what they call a hub network. And, and we have the hub network for Safer Institute in New Zealand. And um, I've also been through their training programs, accreditation programs. So um, they have a, a class of what they call a field professional, which is someone who's sort of been through Alan's training and is able to provide that and is recognised as being able to provide that to other people. So it's, it's, kind of, it's trying to create a standard and understanding. So um, yes, yeah, so I do that for New Zealand as well as other things. That's really interesting. Um, I really think what you were saying earlier about the health of the animal, you know, and that has been reflected in what we're seeing and the health of humans too, you know, and we have just mucked up what we're eating. We've mucked up our food chain so much and now we just resort to pharmaceuticals to try and solve problems that we should be resolving from our diet. Yeah, well, look, it all rolls back and this is where... I guess we focus a whole lot more now and, and, and also yeah, based around, uh, you know, the, it's funny as you learn more and more about this stuff, it just seems more and more obvious. But, but when you think that, um, if you look at the way we farm and, and we, we have no, um, recognize, we don't recognize or even believe if you like that, that the soil is capable of looking after and maintaining a, a healthy ecology. Um, so what we we think we know better than the soil, or we're better than nature in a lot of ways. So when we when we farm now, we we take away, if you like, the freedoms of nature, and and just animals is a good example. So if you know you think about our dairy farming situation, it's all based around a monoculture of ryegrass, sometimes mixed with clovers. Um, we extract everything we can out of the soil, and if we don't think it's delivering enough, we then get into adding. Um, uh, Fertil you know, synthetic fertilizers because we don't think the process that the soil's, the soil's doing is actually delivering on the outcomes. But what, what's actually happening is, is that we're interfering with that natural process, we interfere with the natural balance. And for example, when we put on a urea fertilizer, which is, you know, we think um, everything needs nitrogen and it needs to be added in an artificial way because it can't do, its, do what it should do on its own. Um, we actually start killing stuff. We break down this whole interconnectedness of what happens. So when you think about, you know, what we call this, you know, the soil food web, but when you think about what's happening under the soil, there's much more life and activity happening under the soil than there is on top of the soil. And it's that connection of, again, all those bacteria, protozoa, mycelia. Actually, the, the first interweb, if you like, is just a whole connection of mycelial network that runs between fungi and connects up all our grasses and pastures and trees and and provides nutrients and signals going between these things so when we spray this stuff we're killing all of that so when we break that connectiveness down we actually we actually take that life away so and it's like it becomes more and more of a hydroponic farming situation so if we take that away we actually have to wait it all in so the more we do the more we have to do and we just get in a spiral so if we, if we just step back and let nature do that, actually it does it really well. When you go back into the Great Plains of America and Africa, you have massive populations of, of, of ruminant animals grazing around. Nobody would put fertilizer on that. Now 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. The leaves, if you've got a healthy plant, it'll pull that into the plant. We don't have to add it. So, um, yeah, because what I deal with a lot in my work is, of course, um, well, increasingly is a plant-based approach to nutrition, um, a lot around, you know, the welfare of the planet. But what you're saying is if we look after our soil properly by growing our animals properly, we're going to do a lot more to look after the planet. Yeah, well, if you think what, so we work, we th you know, think about things and, and we, call, we talk about, when I mean, you think about eco-environmental health, or ecosystems health, we, we put those into four classes, if you like. We have, a, you know, we're in the energy game. I mean, if we want to get food, we have to have plants taking energy of the sun and putting that into the soil in the first instance. So we need green mass above ground because the only thing that can do that is the photosynthetic process. Doesn't matter how smart we are, we still haven't invented any other way of converting those sun's energy into energy in the ground and nutrients. So we've got to have you know, healthy, nutritious mass, diversified, diverse mass above ground to help us get that energy in. And then, and then we're alongside that, we've got what we call a water cycle and a mineral cycle, and then a whole bunch of community of, 
of uh, microflora and, and fauna or community dynamics, which helps support that process, if you like. And when we start, the more we start to interfere, the more we start to break down those processes. So if you, if you and, and a really good classic case in point is, is um, we want organic matter in the soil. Organic matter represents we've got good carbon and everything, everything happens in carbon. I mean, carbon is life. So if we start losing carbon in our soils, we start losing health in our soils, which impacts health all the way through the system. And we see that in, in you know, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, obviously is building up. Most of that's coming out of the soils or, or other ways that we're breaking down those life cycles. But if we allow, so anywhere that you see bare soil is losing carbon and losing water. Those two things work out of the, work in or out of the soil together. And um, so a whole lot of you know, what we're doing in, in our extractive mentality and the way we, de we, the way we deal with things is break that health down. We break it down at the soil. We take, we graze our soils too tight. We don't, you know, we don't leave good cover on our grasses. When you look at our agricultural systems, we turn our soils over. So every time we turn the soil over or we damage the integrity of the soil, we're breaking down or, or, or damaging the life within that soil. It's a bit like a skin on us. If we cut a skin and keep having the scab, it just doesn't heal. The same happens in our soils. And so when we turn those over or break that down, we lose carbon dioxide and that's causing all kinds of issues with climate change and other issues. Um, and we, we take away, if you like, the ability of that to heal on its own and actually start to deliver health to us. But if we step back from that, and, it, and this is one of the amazing things about COVID, I mean, we, even within a month, we started to see that nature was given the opportunity to heal itself. It's a hell of a resilient that can actually respond really, really quickly. And we just create the opportunities for that to occur. And that's what Regenerative is all about. It's about creating the conditions for health. We, it's not, there's no definition. There's no saying you've got to do A, B or C, or you've got to qualify to get to a certain level before you start. It's actually just starting to think about how you behave differently, treat the soil or people or whatever differently in terms of allowing the potential that's in there to actually come out and then that'll start to make, you'll start to see that change incrementally. So that's kind of where we come from. Yeah, it's... Um... Hopefully not confusing everybody. <laughs> we try and make it simple, because it is, nature just does it. We don't have to understand it. Well, I think um, most of us have probably seen some of the results of being shut down in COVID from around the world with cleaner water, cleaner air, you know, that happened in a fairly short space of time. So I guess we can translate that to what's going on in the actual soil itself. It's pretty amazing that it regenerates so quickly. Yeah, well, it's, and, and you see, the more, the, it's like a naughty kid. I mean, the more we do for it, the less it wants to do for itself. But if we just back off and let it get back and create those conditions. And, you know, in farming, I guess we talk about it as, um, you know, we want good diversity of pastures. And again, it's, this, it's about principles, not prescriptions. It's not about saying right. ABC works. I mean, nature's complex. It's not going to do what it's told. Again, it's like a naughty kid. I mean, you have two, you know, we talk about the difference between complicated and complex. And when you deal with a complex problem, even as complicated as putting a rocket on the moon, it's actually all linear. It, it's, it follows a logical sequence. You've got a whole bunch of nuts and bolts and you put them together in a certain way and it gives you a predictable outcome. And that's kind of repeatable and reliable and it'll only ever do what we design it to do. But when we think about, but if we think about what life is, life's made up of a whole lot of living beings. And when we, when we analyze where life comes from, it's actually, there is no central, no central power. There's no command and control. It's actually just about, um, you know, it, it, it's we talk about nodalism and mutualism. I mean, it's it's these things are spread. You know, we break, pull a cell apart and try and find out where life is. We can't find it. It's actually spread throughout the cell, and it works because all the parts of it are interconnected. But if we start to pull those apart, it doesn't work anymore. And that's kind of what we're doing. It's it's this mechanistic approach to thinking we can we can understand it. We pull it down to its parts that we think we understand, so we can understand it better. And then we try and put those parts together in a sequence that we can understand, thinking that that's going to represent what, what we're looking at, if you like. 
but it doesn't it only it only works all we ever get is that understanding or that reductionist understanding of what those what those pieces represent and when we put them together they behave completely differently and that's what we call complex so in nature we deal with what we call complex systems so you have you don't have an inventory of parts you don't have a prescriptive process that you can follow to deliver uh, a specific outcome and it's like kids i mean if you've got two kids and you're treating the same they're going to be different because they're a living being they're a living system yeah so we have to think about living systems approach to dealing with our soils or our people or our organizations because if we start if we just keep taking everything from them and treat them like machines they just they they degenerate they degrade we take away that opportunity or the potential that's in there but if we can actually create the conditions that allow our soil to actually come back to that healthy life or if we're dealing with organizations you know this we, we talk about people as being the energy in an organization if you can let people start to thrive and be energized you, you get a completely different outcome and that outcome is unlimited we don't know where the potential of that outcome is because we've never really explored it but if it's a machine it'll only ever do what you design it to do mm. so when we think about shifting the paradigm if you like from where we are now and you know as you were saying earlier we look out you know we just look around us we can see you know things are what's happening in our environment and we can see what's happening um in our waters and our climate and then and our, you know the wastage that we create um when we look at society we've got um um you know high levels of, of social dependence and, and low levels of self-esteem um you've got chronic you know obesity and you've got chronic toxic conditions in our food now these these are all linked to this way that we actually deal with the planet or deal with people or what i call relationships so we it's in this paradigm shift from that it's you know you and i lose kind of approach to actually know we we can, and that that mutualism or that symbiosis has actually had a much bigger impact on the evolu on evolution over time actually than the than the parasitism or the or the you know the one to one kind of relationship so just, it's 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 just that change in behavior just what we call a shift taking yeah so can you um explain to us then the role that ruminants play in in this cycle the cycle of you know regenerating soil and um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a couple of things that we need to just be careful of in terms of um, to, before we sort of, so, so the work that Alan Savory did, um, and the, the groundbreaking work, was really recognising that if, if, you look, if you're looking at what we call brittle kind of environments, so if you think of environments that don't have humidity throughout the year or um, where decay doesn't, doesn't occur easily, those those environments are what go to desert and the and the the unfortunate thing about that is it is again a fair chunk of the planet isn't capable of growing trees so we've got this issue we should be growing trees to capture carbon but 70 percent of the planet can't grow trees anyway so that it'll support rangeland and grass grasslands rather than trees so what alan's really identified is is that if you look at some of the places which are becoming bad in africa and in and, and, um, america one of the things that they did there was taking animals off and this is where some of the work he did really with elephants he ended up killing a whole lot of elephants because they would they believed that if they got rid of elephants the land in zimbabwe would improve it didn't it got worse so what what he through his work what he recognized is is that actually that the material's not decaying so it actually oxidizes rather than breaks down again and gets back into the soil but if you think about what used to happen in the large herbivores that graze across the plain across the plains they there was a few things is that one they were they were bunched and the reason they were bunched is because they had tigers and other things living at the heels all the time so their natural protection was to stay in a bunch and then because they were in a bunch they were putting what we call a lot of animal impact on small areas and then they, you know, that soil that, and then and then they they moved to another area again. So they were constantly moving around the rangelands uh, in big, heavy, bunched mobs, but also with long a long period before they came back to where they came from. So there's a couple of key factors in there: is that 
is that high level of animal impact. So a lot of animals in a small area for a short time with a lot, what we call a long recovery phase was the key to actually understanding how animals can actually contribute to the protection of, of ground rather than the, the degradation of ground. Because what they're doing is that, so when that grass is growing up, they're, obviously they're eating it, but they're also trampling it, salivating it on it, they're providing, you, they're providing water through urine and trample and saliva and feces. It's creating an, a, a compost layer on the surface and then they're trampling that back down onto the surface. So you're also then protecting the soil surface with a compost layer, which is stopping the drying out. The other thing that happens in that though, and in New Zealand, we get a bit confused about this because we think this is just rotational grazing. And we think we're, we're pretty good at that, and we are. The problem is we don't do that based on a recovery period, we do that based on a grazing period. So the key difference here is that you've got a short grazing period and a long recovery to make sure that the roots are recovering before you regraze it. So if we nip a piece of grass, we bite it, it actually, what it does is it, it does a trade off underground, trades its roots off with bacteria, et cetera, for nutrients. If you bite that again, it sloughs some more. And if you come back to that before it's recovered, it's never recovering its root structures. And we, I used to find this a lot in practice is that you go and into the paddock and you'd just be finding the grasses would be pulling out because there's no root structures. Now, and, and, and it's still a common problem in New Zealand. We're still something we're really trying to work hard on because you can imagine if we can grow our roots from 70 millimeters to 700, which is quite possible, you know, you've, you've increased the size of your farm effectively without having to buy more land and a whole lot more nutrients come into it. So, so there's, there's a number of issues there, but so the animal is actually playing a critical role in that in terms of maintaining and supporting the health of that soil. And if you take that animal off, what happens is, is that, is that, um, that grasses, they, they oxidize and they never die down, they never break down. So then you start getting all this decay. That, um, you know, when it rains and the wind blows and things, it just, you just start getting massive erosion and that's how we start getting desertification. So, yeah, the animal's a key part in solving that. Doesn't apply so much to New Zealand because we sit at the other end of that spectrum, of, but um, where we're finding animals still play a really important role is that animal impact and helping get that organic matter, build up organic matter in our soils and get that back in and maintain that, that stability. I suppose I have a really key interest in the role that that protein plays in human health and particularly the role that animal protein plays because it does appear to be far superior to plant proteins for a whole lot of reasons. Um, so, you know, if we, you know, proposals to, you know, sort of reduce the, the number of animals and animal impact, and you were talking earlier about, you know, South, oh, um, where was it? Wrote, um, Zimbabwe was it? Yeah. Um, taking the animals off, and the, you know, those areas are not suitable for growing anything else. And in New Zealand, we can't grow trees. So what would we do with the land if we start removing animals? Well, yeah. Good. Well, we can we can grow trees. We can plant pines, um, which seems to be which is happening. There's a lot of the white rapids going out of animal agriculture and into into pine trees. Um, and, and trees are fine. I don't have a problem. I mean, any any above ground mass that is going to help the absorption of carbon dioxide back into the soil is going to be useful. The problem is pines don't do that very well. There's a whole lot better options. But um, what we should be thinking about is how we diversify use. So we, we, we tend to think about one option or another. Actually, it should be a diverse. I mean, nature doesn't work in, in monocultures or monocrops. It works in diversity. So there's no reason, and you know, one of the things we do with farmers is to encourage them to plant trees, um, not pine trees, but you know, a variety of, and it could be apple trees, it could be a whole variety of different kinds of trees because they, they are part of the diversity which helps us actually create a stable ecosystem. We, but also we want a whole range of different grasses. And some of the guys that are doing the regenerative um, management around their farms at the moment, they, you know, they'll, 
you'll walk into these paddocks and you'll see vegetable crops, you'll see um, sunflowers, you'll see a whole range of different things that are in those paddocks. And when you think about it, you know, you come back to your own nutritional background. What we do to cows is that we say, you know, we go to farmers and they say, well, yeah, we've got good diversity. But they might have a crop of chicory over here and a crop of rye over here. They'll, they'll give the cow X time on that and then the next day they'll go to something else. There's still no diversity in that. The cow doesn't get any choice. But when you put that cow into a mixed into a mixed paddock, I mean, sometimes the first thing they'll do is go to a weed. They might go and eat the top out of a thistle or they might, you know, they, just, they, they have a completely, they have a really high standard of understanding of what they need if they're given the choice. And then if you're not putting competition on those, we, we tend to think that actually if we leave things standing in the paddock, we've wasted it. But actually it's still going to be there next time. And if it doesn't, it's going to rot down into the ground. So we're getting benefit out of it. And that's, again, that's a big shift in, in the way we think. Yeah. And then the upshot of that is that we start to get a more healthy pasture land. So we, and that starts, you know, we, we get, we're building up a diversity in our soils, we're building up diversity in our pastures, we're building up greater levels of resistance because of the amino acid profiles that come into those pastures that we haven't had before. And then that's going into our animals as well. So, you know, we, we start, you start to see this chain of process coming through, which is uh, the ultimate impact of that is what is human health and what we're eating. And potentially use food as a medicine. And, mm -hmm in the way we process it and the way we, the way we farm it. So we can add a lot of value behind the farm ground. Well, I think that's a very important um, concept, food, you know, using food as a medicine. Um, it's definitely, I think, where we need to be heading, that's for sure. So what you're suggesting then means like a whole change to our supply change, you know, there's a whole change in the economy of farming, the cost of food, you know, I guess there's a, a, this is where it gets complicated. Yeah, look, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it is. But, you know, the irony of it is, is that we, we've, we've kind of given our control away, haven't we? I mean, when you, when you think, you know, what, what are we, we go and buy something, we go down the supermarket and we expect that, you know, it's in a little plastic package and it's um, convenient. So convenience has probably driven a lot of, um, a lot of the issues we've got now and and um but again one of the ironies of COVID is, is that you couldn't buy flour because all of a sudden people wanted to go and start baking something you couldn't buy plants because everybody would want to go and plant something so all of you know so it, it people had a bit of a reality check i mean we hadn't experienced any shelves before so um now we've got we can't buy some of the essential items that we thought we just take for granted so hopefully that's been enough of a check for people to think, well, we think about the logical consequences of that. You know, you go, I can remember in my lifetime, you know, you had a, you, you know, you went to the butcher and you went to the baker and you had a whole, and you had a relationship with each of those people and we had milk delivered at the gate and we pretty well knew where it came from. And then increasingly, and I don't think there's any kind of conspiracy, but then increasingly over time, convenience has actually pushed all of that into a supermarket. And then the way it's made and the way it's packaged and the way it's processed and the, it is all, it's all based on, and, and now we wouldn't have a clue. We can't even read the words on the packages are too complicated. Uh, and, it's, and it's cheap, you know, like it's cheap to buy wheat and it's cheap to make seed oils and combine them together with some sugar and create some, you know, highly craved food that doesn't represent anything that humans have ever eaten before. And I mean, this is, I mean, I think vets are really good at looking at nutrition, whereas human health, we ignore the nutritional aspect of our health all the time. Yeah, I think we take, we've, we've come to take it for granted, I think. And, and uh, um, so, yeah, I, yeah, it's a part of what we're really trying to do is re-educate and push back against that um, understanding of how important nutrition is, the way, you know, I think, um, well, my own view, and I'd be interested in yours, is that you know, when you look at gluten intolerance and lactose intolerance and some of these things, they actually represent a, an intolerance to processed food more than they do anything else. Mm. And we've, I think we have seen examples of that where um, 
you know, um, healthy foods have been used actually as a as a therapy for some of these some of these kind of intolerances. Um, well, I I, milk. I agree with you because you know the first thing we do for things like leaky gut and IBS is we you know we reduce all those processed foods and you know we go on these elimination diets and. Um, people start to recover and their gut microbiome starts to recover. So I think that that's, you know, real plays a real key point. But it's just so easy. And then with the vegan, I, I, I know I feel like I'm, I kind of hammer on the vegan thing a bit, but the protein issue is, is a major consideration for me. And with the vegan foods, what I see amongst my clients is everybody's buying something really highly processed rather than going and, you know, eating whole foods and creating the nutrition from whole foods, that they're buying vegan chips and vegan crackers. And um, so I'm not really sure we're achieving what we're setting out to achieve with that. No, I think, I think, I think the vegan thing is probably just represents a whole lot of where people have got to is, is that, you know, I think, I think, a lot of us have just got to a point where we recognise it's broken. We just don't know how to fix it mm. because we probably haven't understood. We, we haven't really looked hard enough for um, at, at, at what, if, if you like, what the root cause is. Um, I mean, again, the irony of, of, of veganism is is that they resort to using plant base without really any knowledge of where that plant comes from or the potential harm that that could be doing. I mean, the biggest. Yeah, the thing that I think is going to be proven to be the worst thing that man ever made is going to be glyphosate or Roundup. And when you think it, when you look at the chronic conditions of today, like leaky gut, like obesity, like Alzheimer's, autism, and some of these things, that the correlation with uptake of Roundup and some of those diseases is about 0.92, just about one to one. And uh, and and people don't realise that Roundup is actually an antibiotic, but not only is it an antibiotic, it's actually a derivative of glycine. So so it, when you round up in the system and it's now become ubiquitous, it starts to break down. So when you get a leaky gut, it's actually breaking down the integrity of the gut because it's working on the glycine. Um, so you you know, and that with a whole lot of other things is really sort of under, you know. So the vegans, when they actually go to um, selecting a lot of those plant materials, Majority of those plant materials are coming from GMO crops, which are actually high in glyphosates. Wow. So while they they're doing that for what they pretend, what they presume to be health reasons, they're actually selecting against their own health by what they're taking. So again, the big advice to vegans is to actually know where your food's coming from and actually what it represents. But there's also this anti-animal impact. So I mean, and people are concerned at animal welfare and the way that animals are, are, are being treated. So they're turning off animal agriculture. And I can understand that to some extent because what the picture we represent is not, is not a good one. We yeah. see this bunch of cows standing out in the middle of a mud paddock in the middle of winter that we were confronted with last year. There's no way we can excuse or, or, or you know, encourage that. And yet we still do. And the chickens uh, and the, and the yeah. pork, you know, and... I mean, everybody wants to buy cheap chicken and, you know, on one hand they're screaming about how they looked after and the other thing they want them to cost, you know, $5 each. I mean. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, so we've got, agriculture's got to fix its game up significantly. Yeah. And I think, as you said, that's a lot of that's about changing the supply chain because, you know, we're locked into these big machine processing plants again, which I mean, as soon as you throw a cow on a truck, it's starting to go downhill. And when you've got to sit on the truck for two hours to get to where it's going to go to a slaughterhouse, you know, it's, it's, it's a different beast by the time, you know, the, the quality of the whole food quality of that animal changes. Its pH goes down, it gets mm -hmm. tougher, it's the nutritional, nutritional quality of it changes. So some of these things are happening all around the world. We just seem to be fairly slow at picking it up in New Zealand. Yeah. And I guess eating seasonally as well, you know, I mean, that's got to be an important component and we've got you know all these exotic foods and fruits and vegetables that you know we can't even grow in New Zealand um, and then we import them you know 12 months of the year so yeah. 
I mean, there's all those kinds of considerations, aren't there? Yeah, and I think, I think, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's again, it, it comes back, doesn't it, to understanding more about our food and where our food comes from. Mm. Um, because if uh, if we can just roll up to the supermarket and which we tend to do every day now and and just you know buy something for dinner, we we don't think about it. So we need to think about our food more. Yeah, and I think you know going back to your point about um, glyphosate. Do you know, I haven't looked into it, but do you know whether it gets, is that one of the toxins get, that gets stored in body fat and, you know, would contribute to inflammation? And... Oh, it certainly contributes to inflammation, yes, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it can store for some time. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, we're topping up all the time. I mean, it's in air, it's in water, it's in, I mean, you, we, we spray out about 20, 25% of the Waikato every year, just as part of our whole MOS program. And, and um, so it's it's a it's a, it's a key part of our of our agriculture in New Zealand and also our horticulture, um, as as are other herbicides and pesticides of different forms now. So some of those um, it's more so the um, organophosphorates is uh, probably more the ones that store in fat for longer term, but uh, um, yeah. glyphosate works a little differently. Mm. It's, um, yeah, we seem to think we have to kill something to grow something, but actually nature doesn't work that way. It never has. So we just, I guess a big part of what we try and do is just to encourage, um, you know, the principle that we use in farming is to just always keep a root in the ground because it's, you've got a root there, it encourages another one to grow and, and you don't have to pull a weed out to grow a plant. It, yeah, they, they grow together. The weeds are usually telling you something. It's usually successional. Yeah, so this is a huge shift. It's going to be a huge shift. Do you think it's going to happen, or how long will it take to happen? We don't, so we don't have a choice. It, I mean, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, I'm on a group called Better, Farm, Better Futures Forum, and, and, uh, and it's the same with the guys that we're having discussions with, with Savory and the Land and Market Program that we've got that's going in, in the and we're trying to get going globally. Yeah, increasingly, you've got a whole bunch of pretty well recognised and, and educated people who are just saying, "Look, we, we you know, we're on a path to extinction." You know, people talk about the fact that um, you know we've got to protect the world. We don't, we don't have to worry about the world. We need to look after it. We need to make sure that we're maintaining it and not not damaging it the way we are. But actually, it's our own extinction that we that we're creating. Mm. We don't change, mm. and um, we, you know we. We're heading down that path pretty quickly. I mean, uh, you know, variously you you see reports of, you know, um, so seventy percent of the Earth's cover is is um, rangeland, and thirty percent of that is degraded already. I mean, we're losing land uh, at about the rate of Portugal every year to deserts because of the way that we treat and manage them. And yet, if we can turn those around, people say, well, you know, this kind of agriculture can't doesn't have the opportunity to feed the world. Well, it absolutely does, because you, when you think of the areas that we've degraded, we can change those back by the way we manage them, mm. and that will and, and so that creates opportunity for employment, for food, for for health. Um, but we just, we just got to have the will. It's, it's our choice. So every one of us has got to make a choice around that every day. Yeah, I think that's a really important important concept actually you've got you know i've got this picture of the great plains or prairies in the u.s you know being covered with buffalo and things like that um yeah well we probably never get back but it's ironically you know we're doing some work with guys up in the u.s now who are bringing back bison and farming bison a lot more and doing it in the old the old ways um you know, people are starting to range to so the big the big thing about it is how we create or how we can replicate the way they used to work originally, if you like. Um, so that means we have to create those mobs and, and we have to move them regularly. And so we need to think about how we can build that into our management. And that, you know, again, that, that's, that's a challenge because, um, you know, in New Zealand, what we often do with our sheep is we stick them on a place and we'll just leave them there for the winter and, and but that's doing a massive amount of damage to our to our soil health. So when we get 
when we get into the summers, we've actually taken away a whole lot of that resilience in that land. So the big thing is, is particularly water. So um, when we manage that land wrong, when, when it actually does rain, very little of it actually gets into the soil. Mm. It'll actually hit the top, it'll have a cap on it, and it'll run off. So then we have a problem with floods or we have a problem with droughts because we're not getting the water to where we want it to be. But as we change our programs, we see that change very quickly. It's amazingly quickly if we, if we can make that change. And then you start to see resilience built back into those, into those lands. And same thing happens in the land you know, overseas. And as you, as you start to make that change, you know, you know, those big, big areas, um, you know, west coast of America, can, which it is now, could all be back into that kind of land. We'd have to, we'd have to find a way of managing it differently. But it's, it's about creating those conditions again. So it's, it's possible. How long, does it, how long does it take for you to see um, some recovery going on? Well, that's the, that's the great thing about regenerative. I mean, one of our challenges and one of, our, one of the good and the bad, if you like, the bad is, is that um, science doesn't explain it. Mm. Because, because the way science works is it's what is this reductionist again. So science likes to pull things apart and then explain them in, in individual parts thinking that that's giving them an insight into the whole thing. But life doesn't work that way. It works as a, you know, what we call a whole or a living system whole. So um, when we, we, you know, and, and it'll be the same in your game, I'm sure. You you feel that you're making progress sometimes before you can actually even measure it. Mm. And that's the same as we get on the land, is you'll start to see the land will just feel better. And particularly mm -hmm. our farmers will tell you, you know, they, they start mm. to feel different. The animals feel different. They just yeah. look different and they behave differently. And then you can start to see things like, um, you know, increases in what we call water infiltration or um, the breakdown. So you'll get, you know, what we call litter or, or you know, broken, you know, grass sort of trampled on the surface. And you'll actually see the soil start, you know, the activity in the soil start to pull that down into the soil. And those things happen very quickly. And then, you know, but, you know, indicators like increase in carbon buildup and, you know, they'll take much longer to show up, but you can start to see what we call those you know, leading indicators of, of change of that the ecosystems processes are, are getting healthier again. And we measure that. We've got a program called Ecological Outcome Verification that we do on land that actually measures or creates an index on the ecological health of the land. So we can, we can, give farmers an indication of where they sit on that regenerative journey, if you like. And, and we, we've got a lot, we're working on a land and market program, which is linking those consumers globally who actually now value that story with mm -hmm. the ability to actually identify that on the land. And that's, so that's a program we've got running as well. And uh, we're doing that with Savory. That's a global program. And what's the sort of buy-in with New Zealand farmers? Are you getting good interest? Um, to be fair, it's, 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 it's an uphill push because we think we're pretty good at what we do. I mean, we've been told that for, for years and years that, you know, we're some of the best farmers in the world, but unfortunately our practices, you know, we probably ended up getting ourselves into a position we don't want to be because we become increasingly industrialized in the way we farm. Yeah. So yeah. it's prescriptive and you put X amount of fertilizer or urea or whatever yeah. on um, we're doing seasonally and you're trying to shorten up production cycles because it's driven by the dollar so much. So, so we do some of the things that have become normalized in our farming activities now are degenerative rather than regenerative. So we, what we're trying to do is shift back re, what we call a redesign. Mm -hmm. We've got to say, okay, well, this is, this is not working. So how do we redesign this to deliver a different outcome? That's, um, but we've got some really good ones. Some, you know, increasingly uptake. I remember back when I was milking cows or contract milking and, you know, it was right when they just started introducing feeding grain in the shed and things like that, you know, buying production, everyone used to call it. Um, yeah. And that's, that's what's happened, unfortunately. And, um, and you know, again, if you, <laughs> the irony of it is if you, if you look at, uh, yeah, the income per hectare has gone up. But, mm. you know, um, but the problem is, is that the profit per hectare hasn't. So mm. the costs have gone up bigger than the income, if you like. And most of yeah. that income is, most of that margin now is off farm rather than on farm. 
Right. So farmers are having to just work harder to stay in the same position or even go backwards. Mm. So they've got increasing debt and a whole lot of other issues that now make it very difficult for them to break out. of. And this is, it's a global problem. It's not unique to New Zealand. So we, what, what we're trying to do is, you know, you talked about supply chains before, is find a way that we can shorten those supply chains and get consumers closer to the producers, both nationally and globally. I mean, we've tended to forget about our national... Our national food is almost mm. a byproduct of our export, so we mm. you know, we want to we want to get some good solid um, food entities or you know, regional food entities going that can actually start linking consumers to to mm. producers across you know across a seasonal basis. So um, and then hopefully we can use that as an education medium to get people to recognise the value of that food and buy good quality food at competitive prices. Well, I suppose I'm, there's probably three things that come out of what you've just been talking about. So one would be changing our view or our mental image of what a good farm looks like. We're used to these green dairy farms and we need to be thinking, you know, like what I'm looking out at the reserve across the road from me here, you know, grass growing and um, all sorts of species and it looks pretty rough and rugged. Um, so we need to get a, probably need to change that image. We reset what good looks like. Yeah. 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 And then um, I'll ask you, well, it probably, the two probably tie together about the supply chains and then what can consumers do to help? And I guess that is to buy local, consider what they're, what they're eating. I mean, I guess we need to put pressure on from the bottom up, really, because it's not going to come. The government's not going to do much about this other than penalise everybody. No, and, and I think I think education is a big part of that. So, um, yeah, we had a, we ran a, a, a sort of a seminar, really, where, where we got into this discussion of this. We, you know, we make our own sausages and a few things like that off, off the farm, so we know what where they come from, and it's, it's um, the legacy beef type, if you like. And uh, so we served up, you know, a sausage that we'd taken and, and one we bought out of the supermarket and we sort of had this debate, well, which one would you buy? But, you know, the supermarket one was a dollar and the one we produced mm. might have been $2. And the obvious answer was was the dollar one, which is where everyone went to, until you started to talk about what was in it and what wasn't in it. I mean, we couldn't even pronounce some of the preservatives that were in this purchase sausage, which was one of the most common products, mm. if you like, that the supermarket and did sold. It actually have, and, did it have any meat in it? <laughs> um, it, had, it had a percentage of meat, but it didn't tell you even what it was. It could have been right. one of three types. Right. And um, whereas ours was 100% beef. So, mm. and then when you started to think about the potential health implications of the variety of things that you had in this cheaper product, mm. um, it started to make it look quite expensive. But it's very hard to have that kind of discussion with a whole lot of people because in the, at the moment, they're still driven by convenience and costs. Um, and, well, then we've got a lot of social problems too that, you know, you can't dismiss that, you know, um, poverty and, you know, lack of income and things play a huge role in people's food choices as well. And then there's the lack of education and the lack of actually understanding that food does a lot more than just taste good and fill your tummy up. Um, yeah, education's an interesting one though, isn't it? Because uh, what what's an education that's going, you know, I guess I've got a mantra that, you know, we what we've got to do first is, is feed ourselves and our families. Then we've got to feed, look at feeding our communities and then maybe our nation mm -hmm. and then maybe we can mm -hmm. feed the world, look at feeding the world. But so to feed us, I mean, so the ability to feed ourselves anymore doesn't rank in our education. We get very little education in terms of how we can be sustainable in the way we feed ourselves. Mm. So, um, but more importantly, we've got to look at how we can get a degree, which, so I think, I think, I think there's a, something there we probably need to think about in terms of, and there's an awful lot of people who would probably be much better off educated in terms of how to feed themselves and then look at maybe how they can create some kind of enterprise around that. Yeah. That be put under pressure to actually go somewhere that's not actually going to help them in their lifetime. Mm. So I think we probably need to rethink that a little bit. And also, yeah, we've got such a cost mentality. Um, 
you know, when you look at our businesses and we start, and it's happening again at the moment, you know, how do we create jobs? What are the jobs that we're going to create? Well, we, we're creating minimum wage jobs. You know, mm. and we've already got a situation where we can't, where these people don't earn enough to sustain themselves. Mm. So, so on the one hand, we need to educate people to use their resources better, but we also need to give them more money. Yeah. They need to be able to earn more money, not be given it, but earn it. Mm. So they feel good about that. They don't we move away from this expectation that someone's going to look after me all the time mm. to feeling good about being able to look after themselves. And I think that you get a massive societal shift. So we, you know, when we talk about this, we're not talking about an agricultural issue. We're talking about societal issue. Yeah, you know, we've got changes we have to make across society. Mm. Um, Huge changes. I mean, yep. where do you start, really? You got but, to, but you've got to start. Oh, we do have to start. I mean, that's what my campaign is about, is about bringing awareness to New Zealanders that we actually have to really start looking at what we're putting in our mouths. We have to really start thinking about our food in a very different way. Um, and then I think what you were saying earlier also about bringing, you know, some of this better quality food back to New Zealand so that we've actually got access to it here rather than that, then it's all going overseas. Yeah, well, yeah, we don't have, it, well, yeah, it's just, it's it's growing here. And I think part mm. of, I mean, there's, uh, you know, particularly amongst, you know, slightly older people, I guess, I mean, they still remember how to garden and love garden. And some, some people are really good at it. So, you know, why aren't we doing community gardens? Why aren't we just growing gardens wherever we can for people to go in and actually go and get things from? Mm. Um, there's massive potential and resource to be able to do that. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, when we're starting to think at local councils and, and local agencies, I mean, I think there's a lot more that we can do. I mean, there are some really good initiatives that are starting to come, you know, the food and schools and that kind of thing. But um, I, I think there's a lot more that we can do as well. Um, someone, you know, just have a goat in your backyard that you can milk. A couple of chalks. I mean, it just yeah. is... Yeah, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's just so many things that we could do. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. Well, your work is very intriguing and um, excellent, I think, and it's a great conversation to be having. And I think, you know, I wasn't really aware or that aware of the progress that was being made in, you know, sort of regenerative organisations and in soil management and I'm quite sure that other people have been really unaware of it as well you sort of just read what the media reports to you and um, and believe it so yeah I think it's really excellent work yeah there's quite a strong propaganda machine trying to hang on to the status quo um, so we've just got to keep um, you know we don't want to get into arguments with anyone but just you know, I guess what I was saying, you know, look out the window, is our water clean? Mm. You know, so what we're doing is not working. So we we just, you know, I think um, what they say about treating alcoholics, the first thing you've got to do is be, you know, is, is accept it, you know, is open yeah. up to the fact that that's the problem you've got or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we still haven't got to that point in New Zealand yet. Well, we need that, we call it root cause analysis in my work. And yeah. the problem is sometimes it's painful, like sometimes the truth is actually painful and you know we don't really always want to hear the truth and we you know we find ways of avoiding it rather than saying this is where the discussion has to actually begin is by telling the truth yeah and there's a lot of protectionism as well in terms of our industries and um but the other part of that is, is you know the, that's the way we've been taught for the last 20 or 30 years so it's actually a lot of younger people coming through it's their reality so you know we've got to be sensitive to all of those things when you when you mm -hmm try and move people into a different space so uh, yeah it's a it, yeah it's a long it's a long uh, it's a long-term prospect but it's it's moving so what would you your advice be to people who decide they want to do something about improving their nutrition through you know sort of like their selection of of food choices what would your advice be to people I think, um, yeah, diversity, they, uh, be aware of where your food comes from as much as you can, if you can and, and, you know, ask questions about it. Um, most, it's very hard sometimes to get answers and 
If you can't get answers, I'd be suspicious of that. If you can't understand what the packaging's telling you, it's probably trying to hide something. Um, so when, you know, when you're looking to buy something, yeah, buy local. I think it's important that we look at how we can develop local food resilience and food security. Um, and you know, as, as you identified before, buying season. I mean, it's um, mm. yeah, some things will. And I, and you know, I, I, you know, I'd be putting in a plug for for farmers markets and for um, yeah, butchers and specialised shops rather than supermarkets because. Um, yeah, well, even though supermarkets look as if they're putting things together for us, I mean, and I'm not against anybody having a good business. You know, for them, it's about um, selling as much product as they can. So it's not necessarily about providing the best health, healthiest product. So and just think a little bit about where your feed comes from. Well, I think I think there's ten companies, aren't there, that sort of run like most of the the big food. I think big it's less food. than that. Less yeah, than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and all highly processed stuff, you know, all in boxes and packets, cheap to if produce, it, expensive to buy. If it's, if it's meant to be a fresh item and it can sit on the shelf for three months, there's something wrong with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, yeah. that's really excellent have, advice. Have a go at cooking your own stuff. Yeah, get back mm. to making mm. your own stuff. It's, it's not hard. It doesn't need to take time. No, it can be very simple and very tasty. Um, it's just, it, it is that change in mindset, I think. And, and learning that, you know, we can eat seasonally and probably that our bodies evolved to eat seasonally. You know, we, we didn't evolve to eat fruit all year round, for example. We, we had fruit in, you know, late summer and early autumn. And, you know, a lot of these foods we should perhaps just enjoy seasonally and then move on and eat something else so that our bodies get that full range of nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, but mix it up, you know, mm. I mean, mm. I, I'm a great advocate of meat eating and I think it's an essential part of health, but you don't have to overdo it. Just, mm -hmm. you know, um, but uh, yeah, um, just, just start to ask questions, I think. Yeah, 